Studio One, Dermot Ferriter and his guest consider what if a particular event in history hadn't taken place, what might the outcome be? Ryanair today launched its inaugural jet flight on the Dublin-London route. Minister for Communications Jim Mitchell was at Dublin Airport this morning and Desmond Cahill asked him how he felt about Ryanair's establishment on the route. Well, I liked it then and uh, I did it uh, again, uh, a lot of opposition. Uh, we did it uh, back in May, and so far my judgment has been vindicated because the growth in passenger numbers on all of the uh, IRC carriers, Aer Lingus and Ryanair, and the other, the British Airlines, has been phenomenal. I mean, we've had growth of 35% in most of the months since uh, May, and that's fantastic, and that's exactly what we've tried to achieve. But do you feel the advent of Ryanair has been a great boost to the Irish industry? I think it's manifestly so. Uh, the numbers, uh, who are, the increased numbers who are now travelling by air between Ireland and the UK, and indeed Ireland and the, the continent as well, because they were just there, there as well, is very encouraging indeed. The late Jim Mitchell speaking to a young Desmond Cattle before he became Des after the inaugural Ryanair flight from Dublin to London in 1985. The new airline came into being after EEC Commissioner Peter Sutherland introduced his open skies policy for the aviation industry, opening the door for small independent airlines to enter the business. Seeking to take advantage of this was Ryanair founder Tony Ryan, former Aer Lingus employee and head of the Guinness Peat Aviation Group. Despite offering significant reductions in fares on routes between Britain and Ireland, it was difficult for Ryanair to establish itself in the marketplace, and by 1990 the company had incurred a loss of £25 million. It was make or break time, and the company responded by appointing a new management team. All non-profit routes were eliminated, and the era of cheap, no-frills flights had begun, as had what became a spectacular Irish business success story, which witnessed Ryanair establish itself as Europe's largest budget airline, with Chief Executive Michael O'Leary at the helm from 1993. The company built up huge cash reserves, and expanded probably beyond Tony Ryan's wildest dreams. By 2005, it was promising to fly 28 million people into 19 European countries. O'Leary had a blunt response for those who yearned after the old in-flight service. No, we shouldn't give you a bloody cup of coffee, he said. We only charge 19 euros for the ticket. And that was Michael O'Leary at his most polite. This morning, we look at some of the what-ifs of the Ryanair story. My guests are Ron Curry, who's editor of Travel Extra, and Pat Byrne, who was the founder of City Jet in 1992. Owen, going back to the early years, Tony Ryan mentioned at one stage that one of the things he was most proud of was that the word emigration had been eliminated from the Irish vocabulary as a result of Ryanair. Psychologically, it was important in that sense that people could have relatively easy access. Really important in the whole Ryanair growth was the ethnic market. It's very interesting that in recent times, it's ethnic uh, flights that are also propelling a lot of its most recent growth into Eastern Europe. It's amazing how clear-headed uh, everybody ger- is, is Jervis, uh, about the early years of Ryanair now. You know, with Michael O'Leary's version of it is that there was this dark age and the guys with the beards and the khaki jackets came down from the mountains and ran the red flag up the flagpole or the blue flag and Ryanair's flag in case and uh, changed aviation. It wasn't at all like that because you had this semi-regulated environment and you had a couple of people having goals at it, pokes at it. You'd moved from a situation a few years earlier where there was uh, a motion brought into the doll to actually <coughs> um, prosecute people for below-cost aviation selling for in the case of travel agents or in the case of air tickets. And you then had this nudge, nudge, nudge with a very spectacular international failure, Freddie Laker, with uh, Avair in Ireland, which also didn't last. Ryanair arrived, <coughs> and one of the great ironies is that in the, you know, in the crisis that you've just described, they were bailed out effectively by the government. The government took uh, Aer Lingus off the Stansted route, gave them a free run at it, and Aer Rienta, uh, you know, did an awful lot to bail out Ryanair mm-hmm. and have got nothing but something like uh, 15 years of abuse since from Michael O'Leary. And there's also the, the, the case at the end of the 1980s that they had 350 staff, they were flying 600,000 passengers. Why weren't they making money? They, the whole economics of aviation had changed uh, massively since then. Um, the, the, it was very, very difficult to to do the sort of things that Ryanair um, have take for granted nowadays. Take a very simple example. The only way they could get fairly, uh, they could get their slots in most of the airports was by not having, not putting up to a gate. The whole concept, you know, which is central to what Ryanair are doing now about the 20, 25 minute turnaround, wasn't possible because you were bringing people by bus into terminals. Now, uh, part of the bailout that they got from Air Rienta was they got exclusive use of Pier A, uh, and that meant that they could actually pull in 
uh, disperse their passengers, load up again and be off again in a much quicker time. And after, there are two Ryanair stories really, there's the one up till 1990 and there's the one since then and all of that, the, the big transition was not a nice stroke of genius or the guys running the, the blue flag up the flagpole and changing aviation but the fact that an Irish government at the time made the decision that Aer Lingus was not just, was not enough, we just, one airline was not enough for this small island far as they were going to do something to make sure we had a second one. And Pat, you were obviously looking at these developments very closely because very shortly afterwards City Jet appeared. But what was Michael O'Leary looking at in terms of outside of Ireland? Was there a role model for this? No frills. Yeah, Michael O'Leary uh, <coughs> has chatted out many, many times that uh, Herb Kelleher and the, the famed Southwest Airlines in, in the United States were really the uh, the airline that he actually wanted or the model he wanted to emulate. Uh, he went there a number of times. He studied it. He came back and he dramatically improved even on that model. I mean, to, to put it in context, uh, Southwest has enjoyed uh, margins on its business of 13, 14% year in, year out over the last 25 years. Uh, the closest anybody ever comes to that, you know, in the good days for other American carriers, you might have had, uh, you might have had United or American coming at 9%, you might have had BA coming at 7, 8 or 9%, um, but nobody really got as close as Southwest. And here we have now the modern-day Ryanair producing uh, a margin of 22%. Uh, it defies gravity. It's it's absolutely, in absolutely, terms, it? absolutely incredible. So O'Leary certainly uh, said he's going to take the best of Southwest and build on it, and he certainly did. And he was very aggressive. And as Ona just said, you know, he really understood very much that what you had to do to make money in this business was sweat the assets, and that meant turning the airplanes around very, very fast. It meant getting the maximum out of your crews, your engineers, out of everybody, and out of your passengers. Well, you mentioned in your account of the City Jet story that there would have been huge pressure on Ryanair pilots as well, just in terms of the, the work rate. Colossal pressure. Uh, you know, everything is about productivity in Ryanair. That's certainly the way it seems uh, looking in from the outside. It is all about productivity. And did you like that model? Uh, not entirely. No, I, I absolutely believe in productivity. Productivity is, 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 is of paramount importance in any business. But I think it has to be balanced. And that, that does need to be a sense of balance in it. Uh, and if productivity also uh, you know, is, is pitted against you know, customer care, customer service, you know, everybody talks about uh, you know, no frills at Ryanair. That's what people expect. That's fine. It doesn't take an awful lot extra, though, to smile. <laughs> There's another aspect to this that, uh, you know, when, he, when Ryanair came in to change aviation, it was very difficult for people, and Pat would probably know more about this than I would, to get anything done. It was very heavily unionized. There was, seemed to be um, a problem for every single solution. Every single thing you wanted to do, there were problems all along the way. Airlines were notoriously overmanned. I mean, all the aviation in world history hasn't made any money if you balance out everything. And the big airlines still hadn't gone down. I mean, there was a shock through the system when Sabina went down and the legacy carriers all began to look at each other and say, we have to do something about the cost of this. Now, what he did was he came across a very difficult situation and cut right through it and made a lot of enemies along the way. But what the, part of the real revolution of what Ryanair has achieved in aviation is not what Ryanair itself has done, but what the reaction of the legacy carriers to Ryanair was. We have an Aer Lingus which is fitter, leaner, and is now delivering fares which are cheaper than Ryanair in, on many risks. Mm. And we have um, big legacy carriers all over Europe who are on the brink of collapse a couple of years ago, looking at what Ryanair have done and what they can learn from it. And they're not all taking the straight Ryanair model. In fact, we've, you know, we've got any number, dozens of different uh, approaches. But what Ryanair's contribution to all of this was they got in <coughs> with the help of that little break they got back in, in 1990, and they, they changed round the, the face of aviation between Ireland and Britain and got early in on a European market, which meant they played... And their impact, the impact of Ryanair has, gone, has been felt all the way over as far as Poland. And you won't mention some of the enemies that Michael O'Leary has made, including, of course, the trade unions. We have a clip here from uh, a particularly nasty episode between Ryanair and SIP2 over baggage handling. Ryanair has asked security at Dublin Airport to cancel security clearance of the 39 striking baggage handlers until the end of the present dispute. The action follows a protest by 35 of the baggage handlers at the airport early this morning at locations including the check-in, the boarding gates and the baggage hall. 
A spokesperson for the airline said the marchers intimidated staff and some passengers by shouting abuse and attempting to interfere with boarding of early morning flights. Ryanair said the action and behaviour of the 35 striking workers was in breach of both airport and security bylaws. This too confirmed that a protest did take place at Dublin Airport this morning, but spokesman Paul O'Sullivan insisted the protest was peaceful and said no abuse or intimidation took place. He said Ryanair was trying to lock out the striking workers on what he called trumped-up charges, and he said the statement from the airline was significant in that it was the first time Ryanair had admitted that 39 people were involved in the dispute. Pat, you would have been out in Dublin Airport an awful lot while that was going on, and you had very strong views on it. I had, because, uh, ironically, the only two airlines that were actually flying through that weekend were Ryanair and Citijet, uh, and uh, Aer Lingus, BMI, everybody else was, 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 had actually down tools, uh, and were trying to make it difficult for everybody else. In fact, it was an absolutely, uh, it, was, it, it resembled a war zone, because uh, security was extremely lax, because even the, uh, the security police walked off the job, and management were manning the fire tenders, and, and the whole thing was an absolute disaster. Um, so... Yeah, but I had very, very strong views because I felt that all of the coverage at the time over that weekend, and particularly on, 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 on RT radio and television, was very, very pro uh, the SIP2 position. Not that I find myself very often sitting on the same side of an argument uh, as Michael O'Leary. I had to uh, agree with him uh, because I felt that the, uh, the intimidation really was coming from, from the SIP2 side. And I felt that the media were actually presenting that view and that view alone. It was almost a, a story of victimization. Uh, of SIP2 and of baggage handlers. There was very little about the, the inconvenience to passengers. There was very little about the irresponsibility of just literally walking off the job. And that's actually what happened, and people might not remember that, but that's what happened. People literally walked off the job in Dublin Airport. And did Michael O'Leary see you as an ally then? Did you record a, a phone conversation you have with He did, because after, a, a, after a many phone calls to RT by myself that weekend, I eventually did get invited on to the RT 6 o'clock news on the Sunday and uh, against a backdrop of uh, very loud hecklers uh, from, from Sutu behind me on the roundabout out in Dublin Airport. Uh, I was doing a live link back to the studio here and basically I was, I was talking about uh, our perspective, my perspective on it and the rights of passengers and the responsibilities that everybody in aviation actually has to passengers. Michael phoned me up uh, the next morning and he said he was delighted that uh, you know, I, he heard me on the radio, he heard me on the television, he heard me the next morning on Pat Kenny on the radio and he said look now that we're on the same side let's go and get these so and so's and let's have a united front and I said to him Michael we are not on the same side we might share some point of view on this but I said really you were an idiot in the way you goaded people as well and two rights don't make and me wrong told, yeah, you weren't going to go take a point to them after that certainly wasn't uh, you know I, I didn't see myself on the same side uh, you know uh, in, in that sense and I wasn't going to become an ally of Michael's there's another turning point on for, for Ryanair in 1997 with EU air transport deregulation, and you mentioned as well that they forced Aer Lingus into a new fare structure. Would it not have happened anyway, even without Ryanair? Even it, would that have, it would have happened because the, dere the deregulation had already started in the early 80s. It had already started. The, the first smell of it was coming. Um, the Freddie Laker episode had been and gone. Aver <coughs> had really been squeezed out, had been bounced out of the Irish market by Aer Lingus's reaction to them. They got a really, really tough time on on Erlings that bought planes in specifically almost to compete with Aver. So there was this feeling <coughs> that the the legacy airlines shouldn't be allowed to have their own way, and it was coming at local level. And eventually, as you said, it came down from Brussels. It was handed down from Brussels. So the deregulation would have happened. The environment would have changed. The difference is that if Ryanair had gone out of business, it would be not an Irish airline out playing for markets, you know, filling flights between Italy and Poland and with between, um, you know, Malta and uh, Germany. It would be uh, airlines from lots and lots of different countries. The difference is we have an Irish airline out playing in that great big field of European aviation and doing quite well at it. Pat, tomorrow I is the fifth anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, the darkest day in aviation history. Ryanair's response to that was extraordinary, wasn't it? In that they said we're going to fly our way out of this crisis. It was, and I think that it was very, yet again, uh, not, not, not surprising. It was actually very brave uh, by, by Michael O'Leary. Uh, it was a gamble. But here he was, he's saying, look, we're going to fly away out of trouble. Uh, and he was right, because I think that had he not, uh, had he not been so uh, aggressive in, in his stance, uh, I think that the airline business would have gone into an even deeper slump. But he was saying, listen, you know, things, things are bad. 
but we're going to, they are going to get better. It's business as usual. Let's encourage people to fly. It is safe. This is a one-off in, in terms of the, mm. uh, the dreadful atrocity in New York. Uh, and I think he was absolutely right. And just going back to what Owen was saying there a while ago, I think that you know, if, if uh, Iran here had, had failed, uh, I think it would have had a catastrophic effect on aviation, uh, as, as we know it in Europe in particular, because I, I, believe, I don't believe anybody else could have achieved what Ryanair did. Ryanair gave the impetus to EasyJet, and it has now been copied by a dozen other airlines around Europe who are all getting in on the Low Cost Act. But it's the Ryanair model they're following, just as Michael O'Leary followed the Southwest model. I don't Everybody now follows the Ryanair model. But also after 9-11, there was this deal they struck to buy Boeing, and there was an idea, really, I suppose, that they could get them at a very cheap price, given the events that had happened. We have a clip here, and we can talk about it in a minute, of, of that particular news announcement. The company today announced it is to buy 100 Boeing 737s, with an option to buy 50 more, in a deal with a list value of $9.1 billion. But Ryanair's chief financial officer, Michael Corley, confirmed Boeing will receive substantially less than this over the 10-year duration of the deal. We'll finance it in much the same way as we financed the previous uh, aircraft we bought from Boeing. Exim Bank, the uh, export credit arm of the U.S. government, is a partner in this deal, and they will provide uh, guarantees for these aircraft, which in turn give us the opportunity to borrow, uh, not by offering aircraft as security, but rather a U.S. government guarantee. Michael, just privately, when you're the Boeing uh, team aren't in the room, do you not sort of smile to yourselves and say, do we really screwed them for the price of these? Well, that's not language that we use in Ryanair, as you know. Well, you do very regularly, to be fair. <laughs> We're very happy with the deal. We found Boeing and Airbus very hungry for this business, and uh, they responded in kind in, in terms of the price offered. Oh, Ryanair would never screw anybody, would they? The villain of the Battle of Sip 2 was the hero of the Battle of Seattle. He, he was cheered by the, the workforce in Boeing. And we don't know what he paid. Um, the, I think the showroom price, Pat, what is in, still involved in aviation, is something around $65, $66 million for uh, Boeing 737-800. We think he got it around 26 27 less than half. So there's a confidentiality clause, I think. Uh, it's, 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 you know, people have worked their way through the accounts to try, but he got it very, very cheap. Uh, it means that he's going around boasting now he has the newest, uh, least noisy fleet. It's amazing how in the early days most of the uh, um, complaints he got from these environmental groups around Dublin Airport were about Ryanair planes. Now it's the opposite. They've got a, g a great fleet. They're part of their, with their, this stream of planes coming on as well, and uh, it means that they have to grow. You know, their, their entire uh, business plan is growth. So is it an exaggeration all to say that if it hadn't been for 9-11, Ryanair wouldn't be as strong as it is now? It's, it may be an exaggeration, because, but um, what it did was it changed, uh, it, it, it got them cheaper planes, mm. really, and that meant that that knocked on in margin, it knocked on in terms of the fares that they're offering to people. And uh, it just, it, the, the sheer volume of it, it also was a huge publicity. Almost everything in the Ryanair story is a publicity coup. They managed to turn the most extraordinary situations into publicity coups. The whole uh, publicity campaign, where whether it's Mary O'Rourke in the bath or the recent one of the Swedish politicians complaining that their faces were morphed on Swedish uh, newspapers, <laughs> um, every, they managed to turn what would be seen as a PR disaster by a legacy airline. But if you're on the other side to this, Patrick, opportunity. Because, you know, if you think about, he's always lambasting state aid to airlines, and he was doing this in the aftermath of 9-11 as well. Was there not huge hypocrisy there? Because the insurance companies bailed out after 9-11. The government had to provide this uh, insurance indemnity, and mm -hmm. Ryanair was the largest beneficiary, and mm -hmm. yet he would be castigating all the, the leading politicians of the day. Yeah, it, it, it is his style, and, uh, you know, uh, truth very often is a little bit of a casualty, I think, in a lot of the Ryanair publicity. Uh, but that doesn't matter, because uh, Ryanair make up their own rules. The whole, the whole idea is there's one speed, and that's a forward speed, and, and you just keep going no matter what. Uh, and if you just like in dumb stores, you know, better value beats them all every day. If you keep saying that you're the low fares airline, people begin to believe you. But try to book a Ryanair flight within a week or even within two weeks of going, and if you've got any change out of 250 or 280 euros return, I'd be very surprised because uh, I, I am that person, and I have, <laughs> I have been caught like that many times over the last three or four months. But that brings me on to some of the, the, the Ryanair horror stories. As well. If things go wrong, flying Ryanair can be an absolute nightmare. Is that fair? 
flying anyone could be a, a nightmare when things go wrong. We can get a little bit obsessed with Ryanair and their marketing message and how false it is, and we can get a, you know how they manage to pluck supports. They you know they hold airports to ransom. You know if you want your Ryanair uh, from service coming in, you're going to have to pay so much money in marketing money, and you have to get people go round to local hoteliers looking for cash off them, hard cash off them before Ryanair will land. But that's the rules of aviation. They're the you know the hard game that you know when you had heavy, top heavy government supported airlines fighting Ryanair, they they have to take them on and win that game. And you know if they if they're all the criticisms that can be levelled at Ryanair could also be levelled at most of their opposition. It's absolutely true. If you book late in Ryanair, you end up playing for, paying for the plane and Michael O'Leary's horse at the same time. <laughs> I remember I had a group of incredulous finance journalists from London listening to the explanation about the Irish funeral, how uh, people in England, you know, who come from Sligo, uh, when they die, they don't alert their friends in advance, and they all have to book late flights on Ryanair, and Ryanair, one of the very few <laughs> cargo uh, deals, that are one of the very few cargoes that Ryanair actually started carrying back to knock in those early days were the uh, air coffins of dead emigrants, because they brought so many uh, emigrants with them. Well, Pat, you talked earlier on about striking some kind of a balance between productivity and how you treat people. Uh, Ryanair have got into trouble with the Advertising Standards Authority here in Britain. Uh, a small example, Easter 2003, emblazoned across the page, Easter specials, and then there's a little footnote that said excludes Easter travel. Do you think he crosses the line? I think he crosses the line uh, very, very often, but again, this is his style, uh, and he wants to be controversial, and he wants to be noisy, and people uh, attach a huge entertainment value to any utterance coming out of Michael O'Leary's mouth, and, and in fact, I have to admit, personally, I find him highly amusing when he is being interviewed live, because he's, 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 he, he is a great character in, in, in many respects. He knows how to manipulate the media. He's extremely good at getting out a very, very clear voice. But they do sail very close to the wind in, what, in how they describe their, their product or their pricing and that type of thing. And, you know, he, he is economic with the truth very often in interviews, I feel, when he's promoting the, uh, the virtues of Reiner. What about on the frills. Are there any more frills left to cut? Are we going to get into a situation where there'll just be a giant catapult that 100 people will be put into and flung in the general direction of Europe? That actually features in an episode of The Simpsons, you know, where the low-cost airline, uh, that's how they project people. Where A lot of the frills were an excuse for, you know, that were thrown at Ryanair by the legacy airlines, you know, saying, um, you know, you get a full service. The full service, in a lot of cases, wasn't really worth a lot. Ryanair, you, you get on board and you pay uh, a few bob for your sandwich and uh, your coffee and you end up getting a cheaper flight. And it, it all worked out. I, I, I can see a situation where um, all the airlines in years to come will be charging for the that two or three extra things that uh, people look for and um, you know, taking it off the fare. What, what Ryanair has started is this business of stripping back the fare to its bare minimum to the extent that when you go to book on a Ryanair website, you're not absolutely sure what the bottom line is going to be because suddenly not just uh, your, your coffee on board or whatever, uh, your newspaper is gone, but also sometimes the, the government taxes very obviously, but sometimes things like gate charges, wheelchair charges, all of these sort of things yeah. get lumped on. They started it. Everybody's doing it now. Yeah. It's it's the way it works. That you 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 know the lead-in fare is what snaffles the consumer. And what Ryanair have done is taken away that bit of transparency. That's what the European consumer groups are getting really really cross about. It's very very hard to see how they're going to be able to do anything about it. But I think too though as well. You know, with Ryanair, the advent of Ryanair, and what people have, you know, the focus has been on what you get or don't get on board. I think the reality of where we are right now, and with all of the security issues, is how people are treated on the ground. And in as much as would there be a consumer backlash? I think that. Well, I think that as, in as much as uh, you know, Ryanair and, and the low fare airlines caused a revolution. Uh, I, I believe that a new type of airport and a new type of handling passengers on the ground could be the next revolution because that's what people really want. They've, they've accepted that they're going to have a very full airplane. They've accepted that there's going to be a far lower level of service on board. But what they really are getting terribly, terribly upset about is the way they're treated on the ground at airports. And congested airports are becoming very unpopular and I think that you know there, there needs to be a whole new look at how people can actually be treated on the ground. And I believe that people will actually start to pay a premium to be treated like humans at airports instead of like cattle. But in terms of City Jet, when you were trying to do exactly that, and you actually had to, I suppose, outdo Aer Lingus in some ways in looking after people, 
it didn't seem to be the time for it, was it? It was slightly ahead of its time. I think that London City Airport, where we were operating into, uh, was a great idea. Transport links were almost perfect, but not quite into the city, which they are, of course, now, with, with the, the light rail goes right into the terminal, but that wasn't then. But I think that we were trying to say, look, this is the way flying used to be, a smaller airport, uh, quality, quality handling of, of passengers on the ground, look after them well in the air, be on time, yeah. uh, and treat them, treat them as people. Oh, last question to you. Michael Leary has predicted by the end of this decade, half of the seats will actually be free, that people will just be paying local taxes, and that Ryanair will eventually become the biggest airline in the world. Is that feasible? It is feasible. It is possible. It's p possible not just because he went out and threw a whole lot of, uh, of uh, cheap seats at people. It's possible because he knows his market. He is uh, as ruthless as Aer Lingus was when anybody comes near his patch. When Goes started running the service from Edinburgh, he took them on. When EasyJet were running services to Knock Shannon and uh, to Cork in, recent, in the last year and a half, he took them on. He threw loads of capacity, dropped the fare. A lot, it, it's pretty central to the success of an airline like Ryanair is the fact that you've got a couple of routes which serve as a cash cow. And he moved in on one of the busiest routes in Europe, Dublin, London, and made a lot of money on it and has kept that. And dare anyone go near it, he'll fight them off. We'll be talking about him in 100 years. Probably. We'll have to leave it there for today. My thanks to Owen Curry and to Pat Byrne. We'll be back at the same time next week to look at the career of Dr. Castello from Media Alberta. Good morning. What If was presented by Dermot Ferreter and produced by Peter Mooney. In this week, Sunday,